Right, welcome back everybody. Um, so we're ready to move on to the next broad theme, which is new tools. And we'll be hearing presentations from Fred Rosakumu with his um, Mosquito Recurrent Chairs in Tanzania, Mercy Apio with um, Screening the Mosquito Entry Points with Novel Long Lasting Insecticidal Treated Nets, and uh, Low Cost Floors. Um, as a measure against tangiasis, a, a presentation from Ulrika Filinga and Lynn Elson in Kenya. Uh, I would, um, we've been asked to put our questions using the Q&A, which um, use this Q&A feature for posting your questions. That's the, the best way to go about it. Um, and now we'll continue with Fred Ross. This is a presentation was supposed to be given by my colleague, John Paliga. Um, uh, we're talking about creating mosquito-free outdoor spaces using uh, treated chairs and ribbons. And uh, I, I believe Paliga is in the audience as well, so he will respond to some of the questions as well. And I would like to begin by uh, uh, indicating that the reason we got into BOVA was the understanding that furniture uh, in different formats uh, constitute um, um, a major you know, a part of uh, housing infrastructure. Uh, in the picture you see there on the left, you see a little bench in front of the house and it constitutes some form of furniture in, uh, in, in local communities. Um, and it's important that um, we treat this as part of the entire built up environment. So this is the, the argument that we, we made at the beginning and the reason that we, we entered that. The second was the idea that in addition to everything else that is being done for malaria control, that it's important to have something else that would address the gaps that we are unable to address using the current core tools. Now, um, uh, this is, we understand this is a very niche uh, environment. The intervention that we are proposing or that we've been testing is not necessarily aimed at um, addressing the major issues, but really just addressing the simple gaps um, uh, that we still have. And so this uh, is a project also about spatial repellents. So as you know, spatial repellents is a type of repellent that you do not apply onto your skin, but rather you put it in an environment and then it prevents mosquito bites from a wide area. In Fakara, uh, we have uh, worked on a number of uh, such repellents and the most common is uh, transflothrin, which is a pyrethroid uh, that has a slightly different and chemical structure, meaning it's less impacted by P450s. Uh, unlike permethrin or delta methrin, it seems to still be effective even in areas where you have resistance to pyrethroid or to permethrin or delta methrin. So um, the slide that you're seeing now, and Fiona, do let me know if my slides are not moving because I think there was a little problem, but the slide that you're seeing there is a representation of the specific gaps that we were talking about. You see there that it's a question of both the mosquito behavior and the human behavior. So you have this situation where, of course, people do enter the houses uh, around 10 p.m or get out at, at five or so to sleep. And during that period, they can use bed nets and so. But before they are inside the house, they spend a lot of time outside. And uh, during this period, they're either cooking or eating or uh, sometimes watching television. It could be watching soccer or some other things or just telling stories. We show there a small representation with two mosquito species, Anopheles arabiensis and Anopheles fenestris, of how the biting pattern uh, overlaps with this human behavior. The aim of our project was to create a mosquito-free or demonstrate some mosquito-free outdoor spaces using treated chairs and ribbons. And specifically, we went out to these villages and my colleague Paliga began by uh, characterizing the nature of the peridomestic spaces. So of course, we're aware that people spend a lot of time in these spaces, but we also see that these spaces are different from house to house, from village to village. 
So uh, my colleagues spent a lot of time characterizing these spaces in terms of, you know, are they built up or not? What are people actually doing there? Uh, what is the nature of the build? And then after that, uh, we considered some of these and tested the two interventions uh, as uh, complementary tools. So uh, this study, of course, was done in southern Tanzania. We worked in a small village called uh, Lupiro in the southeastern part. And uh, uh, the two interventions that we tested, including the transport into the chair, uh, the picture you see on slide number eight, I hope you can still see that, um, is my colleague, uh, uh, Palega, trying to uh, you know, demonstrate how this chair works. So we design small uh, chairs under which you put a Haitian material. That Haitian material is treated with some form of, uh, with, with a transfluorine formulation. And uh, that formulation then works in vapor phase. It prevents biting the entire peridomestic space. Uh, but if there's any mosquito that goes into contact with that, uh, they also get killed. Uh, now, in some of these very domestic spaces, you also have this small kitchen infrastructure that people use for cooking. And uh, <coughs> some of them are built up, some of them are not, some have walls, some have roofs. And around there, you see some kind of Haitian material wrapped around that. That's what we call the ribbon. This was originally designed as uh, uh, to be used around Eve spaces. Uh, it's um, a mechanism to use as little insecticide as possible. So one thing I need to say here is also that the motivation for this in the beginning was to reduce the quantity of insecticides that are used for IRS inside houses. So we thought, just like um, uh, Yurun was saying earlier, that you mosquitoes spend a lot of time in the eave space, that if you had insecticides just put a, on this material, on itself instead of putting it, uh, spraying it on the entire wall, if you just wrap that around the house, you could significantly reduce the amount of insecticide that you use per house. And it's the same concept that we then bring out for outdoor protection uh, in these uh, kitchen areas. Now, temperatures in this uh, uh, small ecosystem are slightly higher than the rest. So that also helps with the vaporization of the uh, special repellent. We did this study in a dry season and also in the wet season. In the dry season, we did only eight households. In the wet season, we repeated this in 20 households. Uh, it was mostly a four by four Latin square uh, design comparing uh, different intervention arms that had either control or an arm with a treated chair or an arm with two treated chairs or, or um, the ribbons. And I will explain that going forward. So in that picture, you see the actual chair uh, under each of those chairs, you see um, um, the Eve ribbon and to, you see the transfluorine material. And um, in the front, you also see uh, what we call a double, a miniaturized double net trap. So that's the same kind of double nets that uh, Stephen Tangena worked on in Southeast Asia. And if you got a weekend of miniaturized it, so you still can do human landing catches safely without um, necessarily letting the mosquitoes reach you, but you catch them in between the outer and the inner net surfaces. So it's, that's a different story. But anyway, that's the way we catch the mosquitoes in the outdoor space. So you either put one chair or two chairs or an leaf ribbon. So it's just those three setups. And under these chairs, we also put some mosquito nets, uh, cages with mosquitoes, just to see if you can get some mortality as well. And here are some um, uh, results. So first of all, 52% uh, of the houses have some form of a veranda, as you can see there. Uh, this veranda is not always um, a serious, uh, like a huge thing. It's just a small extension of the house. Uh, they are mostly used for people resting there, but some people also make it as a makeshift kitchen. Um, then you have um, um, the activities that take place there, just cooking, resting, eating, or other things. Um, of the houses that have the veranda, 67% uh, of them um, have additional peridomestic space. And these peridomestic spaces are built up, so that's what you see in the picture there. And uh, if the house does not have a veranda, even more of them have these peridomestic uh, cooking structures. So. 
in the houses with the veranda, 67% of this cooking faster. The houses without the veranda, 94%. Nearly all of them have this extra, this additional cooking structure that you find in there. And 100% uh, have a roof, but some of them don't have walls. Only 70% have a wall. And this wall usually is a very short um, wall. It's not fully provided. So we think that this, all these things provide some avenue for additional protection. And uh, that's the full structure of what you see. I'm sure many of you work in rural Africa, you've seen a lot of this kind of structures. Uh, this is really the places where you still have a lot of uh, malaria transmission happening as well. Very quickly, dry season results. You see on the PP side, uh, the protection is up to 76% or 81%. Um, uh, against Anopheles arabiensis, we see also protection against Culex mosquitoes, Anopheles um, and then if you check the, trans the protection inside the kitchen itself, so the, that kitchen ex exposure, kitchen um, uh, enclosure, uh, if you put the ribbon around it, you also get some protection out there as well. And then uh, for wet season, we see similar results, 75, 85, 77 for an office protection. You get some protection against Culex as well. Now, I rem remember this is an area where um, we have very strong uh, insecticide resistance. So those, those protection levels are still uh, fairly good for uh, transfiltering. Uh, overall, transfiltering chairs uh, reduce outdoor biting by 70 to 85%. The ribbons the, in the kitchen areas reduce outdoor biting by 77 to 81%. And and then if you put mosquitoes in cages under these chairs, you also find very high mortality, mostly 100%. All of them are dead. Um, you get, uh, in one experiment, we got 5.2% mortality in the control, but mostly it's zero or 0.1 or not or uh, one or less. But uh, for the treatment surfaces, it's nearly 100% mortality. In conclusion, uh, we can say that most houses in this area have an active uh, outdoor space where people spend a lot of time cooking, eating, telling stories and so on. These spaces can be used for additional control measures using special repellents or treated chairs around the uh, uh, treated chairs out there or ribbons around these cooking spaces. Uh, we have uh, tested these two interventions and demonstrated that yes, indeed, they can provide additional protection. And, um, and if optimized, it's something that we could consider for the future. Here in this picture, you see um, the first mosquito-free zone that we created uh, just to demonstrate this. So this is a, a small demonstration project we did with Ebova. Uh, uh, funding um, and this was the first mosquito free space it's really just you know put some chairs out there for this is mostly against Aedes aegypti and Anopheles in the evening and um, people who sit there don't get beaten the, the question usually is if everybody if you ever get beaten there you can blame us but really it's um, it was it was created in January 2020 and it's still going today so that's really good um, we recommend some additional improvements, small scale field trial for this uh, and, and um, the cost effectiveness trial, which my colleague Palega is working on. And we'd like to thank all the community members and volunteers for participating in that. And again, thank you to Fiona and to everybody uh, for organizing the meeting. Uh, my apologies for uh, um, uh, uh, mix up with the presentation in the beginning, but thank you all. And I think I'm going to stop there and take any questions. If any. Thank you. Fred Ross, thank you so much. That was great. I, do, I sympathize with the technical glitches. Oh, it's, it's difficult to get to grips with, but it worked perfectly in the end. And I love your mosquito-free zones. Um, we'll uh, be answering Q&A once all uh, three speakers have spoken on this theme. And the next up will be Mercy talking about her project in Mozambique, screening mosquito entry points. So Mercy, over to you. Thank you very much, Fiona. I'm going to share my screen now. Let me know if it's visible. Is it visible from your side? Fiona, can you hear me? Uh, we can't see it yet, but I'm wondering if Fredros needs to stop sharing his screen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's true. Fredros, could you please? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. There we go. So can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. So thank you so much, Fiona, for this opportunity to represent my colleagues and present our work in southern Mozambique. I know we are not quite visible in terms of vector um, uh, entomology work. But uh, as you already mentioned that our work was basically to try to understand how mosquitoes enter the houses and then screen those particular entry points using the Avima uh, long lasting uh, uh, screening meshes and assess whether they, uh, that would reduce densities of mosquitoes indoors as well as um, kill those highly resistant mosquitoes from the region. So just a, a brief uh, introduction to where we are. So we are based in, um, we are based uh, in Manisa district, which is in Maputo province in Southern Mozambique. So we are somewhere, so we are here. So, <clears throat> so the region borders South Africa and Swaziland and uh, the two countries among other countries are trying to uh, eliminate malaria from their side, but given that Mozambique has a high, it's, it's a high transmission area, even though the southern part where we are based, uh, it's a low transmission area. So the idea has been the, to try to suppress uh, transmission from the southern, from the Mozambique side as much as possible. So on top of bed nets that is used in Mozambique, so there is intensive IRS ongoing. This is done yearly in the southern part of the country. But uh, we still, uh, alongside other interventions, of course, that are, are there for malaria, but we still have sustained malaria transmission in the region. And for us to be able to see this, uh, this gap reduced, so housing improvement is one of those uh, vector control tools that can be exploited in this region. So basically our study here was not to look at any uh, um, uh, big trial, but just to uh, sort of um, test our uh, the, this uh, Avima netting in a small uh, experimental <clears throat> heart trial. I don't know why I can, okay, I can move to the next. So the aims, the, basically the aims were to try to understand how mosquitoes enter the houses, whether they enter through uh, windows, doors, and eaves, or so something that uh, Yeroen uh, uh, has already mentioned before. We already know that um, uh, Fenestas and Gambi do enter, prefer to enter through the eaves. But what we don't know is that how do other potential secondary vectors enter uh, uh, houses. And number two was to try to screen those uh, entry points, uh, in particular the eave spaces and the windows minus uh, screening uh, the, the, the doors with the Avima uh, clofenopal treated insecticide uh, versus untreated insecticide from the same uh, Avima and then uh, without uh, any treatment. So the methodology was super simple. So we had a three by three sort of uh, Latin square design. So we had uh, built three huts, so one and two, and there's another one on the other side that is not visible from this picture. So we received our uh, Avima Clofenopo nets from the Avima company from our colleagues. So we had, uh, uh, it's the same nets made from the, the same way. So uh, the only difference is, so the, the net looks like a, a pictures, see the pictures here. So. The only differences between the, the, the untreated mesh and the treated meshes were that uh, the treated mesh has clofenopa and the untreated mesh uh, did not have any um, insecticide. But again, the other difference was also that the treated mesh was gray in color and then the untreated one was white in color, which of course might have some sort of influence in terms of um, attraction to mosquitoes. So the, the study was, we did a very simple uh, study. So every first uh, week of every month, we conducted the, the entry study where we quantified the, uh, how mosquitoes enter the, the heart. So this was done between 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And we fixed uh, the, those entry point with our uh, entry trap that we modified from the exit trap so as you can see in the pictures around here. So we fixed this in the, in the uh, eave spaces, door, uh, windows and uh, under door spaces as here. And then there's uh, every second, third and fourth week of every month, we conducted the second aim of the study, which is screening those, the entry points, which is the eave spaces and um, windows 
So uh, each uh, hut received a, a, a treatment. So we had three treatments. As I've mentioned, it was a three by three. So each hut received a treatment. So for example, day one, we give um, clofenopoid to hut one, and treated to hut two, and control had nothing on the windows. And we did rotate um, the treatment uh, across the, the huts. And the volunteers slept in their huts between 6 p.m. to 6 a.m for both uh, entry and uh, the screening part of the study. And the last uh, ob ob objective of uh, this was to also try to understand how the clofenopa um, acts over time, uh, whether it's affected by uh, the environment or being exposed into the environment. So how would that affect the, the bioavailability of the clofenopa itself? So what we did was we cut pieces of the same uh, mesh and we exposed them we hung them out in the in the sun where they're exposed to sun and rain. And we also had a, a bunch uh, of those nets uh, prevented or protected from sun and rain just to uh, see how all this uh, will affect um, the, uh, the product. So moving forward to results. So we had, um, uh, so the, I'll start with the entry part of the results. So we had, uh, I have to mention that it was, um, the density was very, 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 very low. One thing I didn't mention in the methodology is that the area we are based in is uh, we have super, super resistant um, uh, anopheles fenesters, and we also bought a very large sugarcane irrigation um, uh, uh, a, a, a place. It's, it's it, yeah. So we think that this uh, the resistance there could be contributed partially through that. But anyway, so the huts are built very, very close to the to the sugarcane area that a plantation. So looking at uh, the results from the entry, so we didn't quite get a lot of mo uh, mosquitoes, but we can see that um, uh, we uh, the ones that we were able to to cut, they get to they enter the houses, the huts through windows, and uh, and because we are also very much interested in those other potential secondary vectors like tenebrosus can see that we caught most of them um, in the windows. So there's one thing I need to mention here that uh, in the next slides, you will see that we have pharaohensis, but we were unable to uh, capture them in the, in the in our entry traps. So I think this could be because uh, uh, we, we, they, there was some sort of, um, we needed to redesign some uh, our entry trap, maybe to be able to, to capture most of the, uh, the mosquitoes that we might have missed. And moving forward to uh, the screening findings, uh, so I will uh, present this in, in, to, uh, in regard to primary vectors in the region and also the potential secondary vectors. So looking at the, based on our analysis, uh, we did not see uh, any uh, differences between a control insect treated mesh, where we call it ITM, and uh, untreated mesh, which is UM. So there wasn't any differences between uh, control and uh, the, the treatment. So by what we ob observed is that we, there were a uh, high number of mosquitoes in the ITM and UM, UM, but this could be for many reasons, yeah. So <clears throat> moving to uh, Anopheles gambi densities, how the, the, um, the screening affected this uh, popu population of mosquitoes. So again, the, uh, the similarity it was the same. Uh, we did not see any differences. In fact, we saw uh, a little bit higher number in the in the treatment as compared to control. Uh, let me go back a little bit. I would like to explain why we have Procopac uh, here and Flo. So we were also very much interested to uh, see whether Clofenopa would have some sort of uh, delayed effect on the wild mosquitoes that are crawling through the nets and uh, getting into contact with the with the insecticide, but unfortunately, the density was so low that such that we couldn't have enough uh, power to, you know, to kind of have like a proper analysis for those uh, mosquitoes. Uh, moving to other potential uh, secondary vectors in the region that we capture in our uh, other studies, as well as this particular one, you can see that uh, again we did not see with CDC light traps we did not see any differences in terms of uh, reduction in density inside the houses. 
and we can see that uh, what we saw was a slight, uh, slightly higher number of mosquitoes in uh, tenebrosas in um, ITM as compared to, to control, but there wasn't any significant differences. By looking at the Procopact, you can see that there were lots of mosquitoes flying when we Procopact in the morning when we collected the CDC samples. <clears throat> And again, as uh, in general, uh, we can say that uh, perhaps uh, the lack of these differences could be could be partially attributed to the fact that clofenovir does not really repel, neither does it irritate. But there are, of course, a number of uh, uh, factors that might have occurred during uh, this study that uh, led to uh, this. So moving to the last uh, potential vector, the, the most common uh, secondary potential vectors that we find in the area is uh, Anopheles pharaoensis. As I mentioned, uh, we did not uh, capture this in our entry traps, but you can see here we uh, it's uh, it was a bit higher as compared to even Fenestas and um, and uh, Gambi. But again, there wasn't any differences in the CDC light trap catches. Uh, in terms of uh, control, ITM, and uh, UM. and uh, again, the Procopac, we were able to uh, see a few of the mosquitoes flying inside the house in the huts in the morning. But uh, again, we couldn't, we haven't analyzed the, the little that we have because there are very, very few number in terms of uh, um, delayed mortality. But we are going to look into uh, the ones we have and see if there was any effect, if, even if there are five or six mosquitoes. So. Moving to the bioefficacy of the clofenopa that is exposed to sun and the ones that were um, not exposed. So basically what we did was to expose them for 30 minutes, expose the susceptible colony that we have in Manisa for 30 minutes to the, to the, to the nets. And then we monitored them uh, for 24 hours and beyond. But looking at the first panel here, this is the, the result from the uh, the meshes that were exposed to sun and rain, and on the left, the right side, we have the, the results from the meshes that were not exposed to sun and rain. And you can see that bioefficacy is good. Mortality is quite low. I mean, after month one, in 24-hour 24, 24 mortality is super, super, super low. But um, looking at the, the delayed mortality, you see it's slightly improved. But again, with time, it's, it, it, it went down quite a lot. Uh, in both um, the batches of uh, um, the, <clears throat> the measures. But there are a couple of uh, explanations to this. Uh, one could be that uh, uh, the, uh, the difficulty of uh, the chemicals, you know, uh, becoming available on the surface uh, of the meshes, that could explain one uh, reason why this, uh, this happened. The other uh, part is something that um, uh, Richard Oxborough's team has explained previously that uh, clofenopa is a new, um, it, it's a, a new active in, in ingredient. And the way we currently do the uh, assess the bioassays, we do assess it based on the pyrethroid um, uh, procedures. And if you look at how clofenopa act in uh, target insects, it requires uh, once it gets to the target insect, it requires that the it it um, it to be activated within the target insect. But this only happens when the uh, the mosquito is at its highest metabolic peak. So if we do this bioassays, perhaps during the day, when mosquitoes are a bit uh, at their low metabolic peaks, then perhaps the activation of the the active toxic compound might not be activated enough to. To affect the mosquito, but this is something um, worth investigating as well. But it's well outlined in a uh, Oxborough's paper. But there are also a couple of uh, other things that could explain this. And please do feel free to share as well. So, in conclusions and a way forward for this study, we clearly did not see any differences between. Uh, those treatments. We do not see any difference in terms of density uh, reduction or entry into the hearts. And the, <clears throat> the effect of delayed mortality, we could not assess this. As I've mentioned, that this was really, really important to us because we wanted uh, to see, uh, to assess that given that the, the meshes have holes, so the mosquitoes could crawl through the holes and pick, uh, hoping that they could pick sufficient amount of uh, product and 
in the end, we could be able to see whether that affected them, but we were unable to assess this, but this is going to be done in the next phase of the, the study, this, this trial. And uh, again, by efficacy of the Avima clofenopan mesh is, is shorter than we expected. So this is not surprising again, because uh, clofenopan, uh, the way it, it acts uh, when monitored in standard w, WHO bioassays from even other studies, it has shown really, really low um, mortality if in 24 hours. But if the delayed mortality has been shown to improve quite a lot. But again, the time, as I mentioned, that Oxborough's team had a very nice uh, explanation about um, why we could not be seeing greater effects when we we do the routine, the standard routine as we do for um, pyrethroids. And um, <clears throat> we had a chat with the Avima colleagues who are providing us with the mesh. And uh, again, we 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 all uh, agreed that perhaps the the low concentration of the chemical uh, content on the surface could have been uh, uh, this could have happened uh, as a result of the the mesh the, the 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 production. So perhaps during that period there was some sort of uh, uh, problem. But uh, this morning I had a chat with uh, my colleague uh, from Avima, and he uh, said that. Uh, they have now come up with a better way of quantifying the product um, on the on the mesh, and uh, the way forward is that uh, for the remaining months of this uh, project, we were uh, based on our um, discussions with the Avima two weeks ago. We they have uh, sent us uh, alpha cypermethrin instead of uh, clofenopa, so we'll be using alpha cypermethrin. I know some of you might be wondering why um, use this uh, when we have uh, resistant mosquitoes in the area. But we also want to focus on the secondary vectors that could sustain transmission in the region. So the other thing is that they will also send us their improved uh, clofenopa batches, but uh, we will not use it in the, in the experimental heart trial, but we will just try to do uh, the bioassays and see how that uh, uh, works, given that uh, now they have improved ways to measure their chemical content. And again, one thing that we really thought would be very nice with the screening um, uh, meshes that they have, if they could uh, combine clofenopa with another active ingredient. So as we, we know that the clofenopa has been combined, it's currently being tested with uh, alpha cypermethrin. So could be that uh, this uh, clofenopa needs another active to be able to perform much better. So this is something that they are uh, currently uh, discussing and uh, we'll see what happens. So this is the end of my presentation and I would like to thank um, my colleagues from Manisa who were able to support me with the work even when I was away. I got stuck after <laughs> after lockdown but yeah so and thanks to everyone who has made this work uh, very possible. Thank you all. Thank you, Mercy. Uh, and these, this is really important information that you've gathered as well. Um, uh, and although, uh, you know, one, you know, you're looking forward to sort of very positive results and so on, when things don't work as well as you imagine, this is actually essential to know. So we'll move on swiftly now to Uli, um, Ulrika Fillinger and Lynn Elson, um, who are going to tell us about uh, new flaws of the intervention against tendiasis. Oh, thank you, Fiona. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope my slides are visible. I think I have to apologize. I have some fighter jets actually flying over my house. <laughs> it could be noisy in between, um, but I do hope you understand me well. Um, our project aimed at improving house floors for tungiasis prevention. Uh, and I think given that we are a little bit the odd one out, uh, I thought I'd briefly introduce this uh, disease. Uh, so tungiasis is a highly neglected parasitic skin disease that's caused by the penetration of female sun fleas into the skin. Uh, Tunga penetrans is the smallest flea in the world yet it causes very high morbidity in endemic areas and has long-term physical, emotional, and mental impact. It comes with chronic pain, disfigurement, reduced mobility, which in turn then um, increases the severity. Yeah, so as 
every other neglected tropical disease, uh, tongaiasis comes with a lot of stigma and shame. So this the next slide, please. So uh, yeah, this, these drops are shed, they fall to the ground, uh, and on the ground they require loose soil and sand for the fleas to develop. Uh, and it takes around three weeks for the adults to emerge and then to find their blood host again. Next. So last year we published a, a paper where we had done a risk factor study at the coast of Kenya, where we looked at, um, at the, the impact of dirt floor uh, amongst other factors. And we found that if exposure to the risk factor dirt floor would be removed, we could probably prevent over 30% of mild um, tongaisis cases and over 50% of severe cases. Next. So the problem with that is that most of the tongaisis affected families can really not afford a, a standard floor as we know it. The concrete floor in Kenya costs a minimum of $10 per square meter in Kenya or around $300 for a small house. That's well beyond the reach of most tongaisis affected families. And so we were looking for a flooring solution that came at a lower cost, was readily um, available of, of its using materials from the local market, but still prevents some flea development. Next. So we've done that study at the um, area at coastal Kenya, where we have a close collaboration with a community-based organization, which was the implementing partner at the site. Uh, we've done that also for sustaining this project beyond this pilot project period. And all of us know the Kenyan coast for its beautiful beaches, but I think <laughs> a few of us know that even if you're only just going uh, 100 meters inland, there has, is extreme poverty. Next, please. And the, the affected families, so those that are most affected by tongueses, are the most marginalized resource poor populations. And what you see here is really the housing conditions. So they really do live in makeshift housing. Uh, next, please. So, so the, the problem for us, this was really a challenge because we needed a certain quality of a house so that we even, you know, building a, a floor inside was feasible and also use, useful. Uh, next, please. Another big challenge was uh, presented to us by the climate conditions. Just click next, please. Um, so here you see um, the rainfall pattern over the past 10 years for the, for the coastal areas. And our pilot study, uh, Lynn, just click the next was falling right into the, the wettest year in a decade. So why is that a problem? It's because tangiasis thrives in the dry season, but even in endemic areas, it can completely disappear uh, when it is extremely wet. So you can see that has of course complicated our ability to actually uh, assess the outcome of our flooring. Mm. Next, please. So we had a two-step design for our, for our study. We first developed the floor from March to November last year, where we interacted with um, the community to find out more about flooring in the community. We looked at the soil on our sites. We did some experimental outdoor slabs before selecting our floor. We then took that floor uh, for the impact assessment. Next. Uh, so we, we had a, a baseline assessment of the pathology and parasitology and then randomly allocated to three treatment arms uh, the interventions. So we had 36 houses, 12 we left as we found them, 12 got a concrete floor uh, and 12 got the new floor. And then we had since then six monthly assessments. Uh, and at the moment, as we speak, we have our final survey going on before we then put the, the control group also a new floor. Next, please. So in our interaction with the community, it was very clear that built floor is not a priority for, for um, tongaisis affected families. A floor might be done much later if and when there is money. Uh, 
there was not much done to harden the floor, except maybe regularly watering, um, just to prevent the dust to come off. Uh, addition of fire ash was occasionally be done, and traditionally, um, there was building done with soil from termite mounds. What was also interesting is that houses and floors were really built with material that came largely from the family's own plot or close by land. So there was very little money invested actually for the entire building because money is, is not there. Next, please. So we went around, we looked at all the soils that we, that we found in our target area and clearly that was a very poorly graded sandy soil with a very low, if not absent, clay content. So very low intrinsic binding ability uh, by the soil itself, but lending itself, of course, for, for cement stabilization. Next, please. Um, so based on, on our initial findings, we um, trialed different material con uh, combinations in outdoor floor slabs, uh, and we aimed to use material that was actually accessible for the communities there. Next. So what we did, we came up with 15 different combinations. They largely differed actually in just the floor depth and the uh, percentage of cement that was used. And you see there will be only two slabs, number nine and 10, that do not have any cement used at all in them. Next. So in, in absence of any kind of professional testing equipment, uh, we just came up with a set of, of measures to see how strong our slabs were. Uh, and we, we, for example, put a heavy weight in a wheelbarrow and, and wheeled it over the slabs, a stick to scrape on. We looked at water absorption. We, we dropped a rock from one meter 50 height and see at the impact. Next. So we came up with a scoring system and we looked at day eight and day 28. Um, zero was no impact, three was a lot of impact. We used the same system later on for our trial floors in monthly intervals. Next. So after 28 days, we looked at the results from our scoring. And the lowest scores are obviously the best. So those gray highlighted are the lowest scores. Then at the same time, we looked at the last column on the right, where you can see the estimated costs for the floors. And next. So what we did is to select floor number 11, which was a simple cement stabilized soil floor that came with a reasonable score and a low cost. And that one we took for trial. Next. So this is just to show you how our houses on average looked like and the treatments were randomly collect, uh, allocated. Next. This is our, the floors as we found them at the baseline. Next. So here we prepare the old floor for the new floor by breaking up the old surface, dumping down the old surface. Next collecting local subsoil right on the side where the house is for the new floor mix. Then the floor mix gets mixed with the cement, water, and then brought inside the house, tamping down the new floor. And then at the end, just got a finish, a very thin cement finish, uh, which primarily was on request of, of the inhabitants of the house. Uh, in contrast, the, the standard concrete floor, we, we prepared just the same way the builders would do in the area. So it had a, a thick layer of hard core under it and then a much thicker um, concrete slab on top. Next. So every house that we had enrolled in the study had two to five tongaises infected persons at the start and we followed them up regularly. So a total 112 participants between two and 22 years. Uh, unfortunately, we lost four out of our 36 houses to follow up. One burned, one collapsed, two families moved away, reducing our sample size even further. Uh, we had a lot of of outcome measures that, that we recorded. 
uh, from the prevalence of tongaiasis at household level of um, acute and chronic pathology, the number of fleas and also a quality of life index. However, at this point, I'm only giving you a very brief and, and, and preliminary glimpse in our data because as I had indicated, we are still collecting data uh, and we really want to have a comprehensive analysis done at the end. So this slide, if you just look at the left side in December, you see we had 100% prevalence in all households in all treatment arms. If we just focus on the blue boxes for now, uh, which show the results from the control houses that remained with the natural floor, then we see that the prevalence declines over time and reaches a low in May and June. Now that coincides with the wettest season, so that's one of the reasons why it declines, but we also think of course it declined because we had, for ethical reasons, we had to treat all the patients every time we found someone infected, and of course that affected our control and our interventions. What's also immediately apparent, I think, is the high variability between households. All of this obviously complicates now the assessment of our impact. Um, nevertheless, if you just focus on the, on the right ones that are the concrete, concrete flaws, uh, we see uh, an immediate drop in the prevalence rate to approximately a fifth of what we remained with in the control houses. But there seems to be in the first three surveys no impact um, for the new floors. We are at this point not exactly sure what might be the reason for that. Uh, but then the rates also drop. But again, unfortunately, now this coincides with our drop in, in uh, the control prevalence as well. Now, we've observed over the past two months that with a little bit of drier seasons, our cases increase. Uh, and so we are very keen to see what our um, survey will bring that we are implementing at the moment. So just looking at, at those odds ratios down there, there is a, is a trend in the direction we expected, um, cutting the prevalence. However, given the small sample size as well as the high variability, I think it is not coming as a surprise that our p-values do not reach the 0 0.05 level. Next. So we also did, we collected the sun samples inside the houses and looked for the off-host stages, meaning the flea larvae inside the soil samples using heat to extract them. Uh, next. Uh, what we found very interesting is that we actually found a correlation with the between the number of fleas in our soil samples and the infection intensities of the people inside the house. Uh, and we're very keen to follow this further. Mm -hmm. Next. So in, in, case, in, in terms of durability and costs, both floors performed equally well over the 10 months uh, period that we now observed them. So, so both were fully intact. We had two floors out of the 24 where the finish flaked off in some patches. You see that on the photo here. Uh, and we put that down actually on some mistakes by, made by the builders. Uh, in terms of project expenses, we estimated the costs for the floors and we confirmed that the standard concrete floor for those communities, if they purchase everything locally, would come to around 10 to 11 US dollars per square meter, while the new floor would come uh, a third of the cost, $3 per square meter. Next. So as I said, the study is still ongoing. We had some hitches, obviously, due to the COVID outbreak. Uh, we are at the moment doing our final household survey. We are doing an acceptability assessment. We are also still planning a willingness to pay survey before we put in our 12 floors in the control houses and close out the study and then really get down to comprehensively analyzing our data. Next. So there were an awful lot of lessons that we learned uh, also with the challenges that we got during the project. Uh, we conclude 
that low cost cement stabilized soil floors are a good available strategy for house improvement for the poor households in coastal, coastal Kenya, where we have a very sandy soil. The occupants really liked the new floor, found it easy to clean and looking beautiful. Um, but there is definitely more to Tungaisis control than a floor, I think. Um, however, the trend of our, our results are in line with the predictions from a risk factor survey. But really, we've, we've realized that there's a very high variability between households and it goes down to participant behavior. Uh, and there was a lot of movement between houses and rooms and that increased so surprisingly during the COVID outbreak, uh, children moving around, uh, etc. So we require much larger sample size. Um, we also think that we need a, a, a stronger formative research that is done before we plan an intervention and then tailored to that uh, also have behavior change interventions that are running alongside the new flooring for greater impact. Uh, and largely we really learned a lot by interacting with the builders which we found very hard at times to manage to get them to adhere to the set protocols for our uh, new floors. Uh, next, so just to say, we're very happy to report that this is not the end for us, it's just the beginning. For one, our community partner is really enthusiastic about the new flooring and has taken up advocacy and some community members already adopted the new floor. Uh, but we are also very excited that under the leadership of Rachel Cullen and the London School, we've received a, a follow-up grant for the next three years to understand the contribution of household flooring to disease burden in rural Kenya. And this will now be looking not only at tungiasis, but soil transmitted helminth and bacterial infections as well. Uh, and with that, I come to the last slide just to thank everyone that was involved in this study for, for the hard work and especially also the network and the funders for supporting us. Thank you very much and my apology for the technical hitches. <laughs> thank you so much, Yuli, and that's fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm so pleased that you are going to get further funding for such important work, such a thorough, thorough study in the face of really tough conditions and your results are so tantalizing. So thank goodness <laughs> that you're going to be able to progress. Well done to you, to you both and to your teams as well. Um, and now we're, we're running a bit short on, we're a bit behind our schedule, but if we, if we so we have a few minutes for questions. If we go up to if we go to 10 to 3 for our questions and then take our break, um, we'll kind of be back on target again. John and Fred Ross, how is the business? This is a question from Bart Knowles. Uh, I will tell you this offside, Bart, going good. <laughs> uh, second question was, why do you think the protection from the chairs was better than that of the ribbons? Well, there are two possible reasons here. One is that we used a CDC light trap for this collection. CDC light traps don't work very well outside. They work better inside the houses. The second is that in this house, in these kitchens, there's cooking. So there's some smoke there as well that kind of pro probably repels mosquitoes and that already has some effect. So the additional benefit that you get from the ribbons is not as much as what you would get uh, from the chairs in the outdoor space. And uh, so that's all good. Um, there is a question there on how often do you have to replace the treatment? So there's, I'll take actually two questions. There's that, and then someone also asked for how long we do the assessments. And the simple answer to this is that when the ribbons are treated, they can last you six months to one year. And the, the best results we've had in Ifukara is 140 weeks. Uh, so this is a pretty long time. Uh, standard practice is that we get replacements every six months. So. Uh, um, in this particular study, the, stud, uh, the assessments didn't last that long because of the duration of the study, uh, but uh, uh, working with the Hessian treatment, uh, Hessian material treated with transglutrin, we know from several studies that these treatments can last for up to six months. 
I think there's only one last question to me, which is sampling conducted from how long, and I guess I've answered that already. If there's any question that I missed, I will go to the ones that are on the chat box. Uh, 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 Fred Ross, don't worry, we'll go to Mercy now. And don't worry too much because I'm going to, um, we'll be collecting all the questions and, and really? um, we'll be feeding, um, I hope you guys who are speakers won't mind, but we'll eventually feed over to you ones which maybe weren't answered today. So people Fantastic. will get get um, feedback, but uh, Mercy, the next one's to you. What do you, what did you do in between rotations of treatments through the Latin Square? Uh, and a question about cross contamination. Uh, Mercy, you need to unmute. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> So yeah, that's a very good question. So what we tried to do uh, was uh, we had um, a friend, we had our nets uh, attached to, to instead of directly pinning them on the windows or, or, or eaves, we had a, a wooden frame where we attached the nets. So these nets were just specifically for each treatment. So the other thing that we did is that after um, removing the uh, sampling in the morning, we had to to remove everything and let the rooms uh, sort of air it for a, about uh, six hours before we start our next experiment. So uh, the other question is, uh, how big was the mesh used relative to untreated window screens, for example? So the windows in size, the meshes were 50 by 50 centimeters and the windows and for the eave space and the door under the door spaces were five centimeters. So we have them, um, uh, five centimeters uh, uh, big. Uh, to the guy who asked a question that uh, uh, um, who is curious about the post exposure effects for those mosquitoes that were sublethally ex exposed to clofenopa mainly on feeding pattern. This is a very good question. This is a, this is a question we often get from our National Malaria Control Program meeting. So how do mosquitoes that are already exposed to clofenopa but they can still fly around, how, how are they affected in terms of feeding? But this is something that we are going to look into in the next um, phase with the new batch of nets. We will try to do this sort of behavior uh, study. So we haven't looked into this. Okay, dogs, thank you, Mercy. And well, let's just have one quick one, I'm afraid, to, to Lynn and to to Ulrika um, asking about the insides of the walls, whether they, they could be improved by the same materials. Um, can you see that guys? So they want to know, do you think if the inside the wall was improved with the same materials as those used for the floor, uh, could you maybe have got a greater impact? Early or Lynn? <laughs> Lynn, you want to go? <laughs> Okay, thanks for the question, Josephine. Um, I'm not sure that, obviously the new material could be put on the walls and that's something we'd like to explore just for uh, strengthening the houses and making the house itself last a bit longer. But in terms of its impact on jiggers, I don't know that it would be much different between the concrete floor. It might reduce the amount of dust that's falling onto the floor and have some impact. So that could be something to be thought about in the future. Thank you. Um, I think we'll take a break now. Um, speakers um, can answer these questions in the Q&A if they would like, but as I say, we'll be sending them on to you later. Uh, and maybe uh, if we could take a 10 minute break now, that will get us back on target. So see you all in 10 minutes, is that all right? <laughs> 